thank you so much for coming um, and for fighting to try to find a, a parking place and to find this new building. This is the inaugural lecture, public lecture event in this new gateway building. So I'm glad you could find it. It was a great honor to have Dan be here to, uh, to inaugurate it for us. I'm Robin Kimmer, a um, member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, faculty member here at ESF, and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. And I'm so delighted and honored to have Dan Wildcat with us here today. He has long been one of my heroes and, and perhaps um, one of yours as well. He's come all the way to us today from Lawrence, Kansas to meet with students and faculty, which he has been generously doing all morning, talking to people. Um, and he'll share his work with us this afternoon. Dr. Wildcat is a Yuchi member of the Muscogee Nation of, of Oklahoma. He's an internationally acclaimed indigenous scholar, writer, teacher, and professor at one of the nation's great tribal colleges, Haskell Indian Nations University. And at Haskell, Dan teaches many classes for the last 25 years at the intersection of sociology, culture, environment, and traditional knowledge. He is the founder and the director of the Haskell Environmental Research Studies Center, the first of its kind in the country, and he is now serving also as the Dean of Natural Sciences. In Indian Country today, there was a great interview with Dan where he talked about why he wanted to become a, a professor, because you ha had this opportunity for critical thinking and reading and writing, but given the schedule that you have and all of us, Dan, I, don't, I want to know how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Dan is a, is a protege of the late and, and great Vine Deloria Jr. And he serves that legacy with great distinction through his teaching and his writing. He's the author of numerous articles and three very significant volumes which are available at the back table. And Dan will be um, uh, happy to sign those for you after our, our talk today. Um, they include Power and Place. Indian Education in America with Vine Deloria. And he's co-editor with Steve Pavlik of Destroying Dogma, Vine Deloria Jr. and his influence on American society. And his newest book is called Red Alert, Saving the Planet with Indigenous Knowledge. It's a real call to consciousness on engaging indigenous philosophy and wisdom for environmental problem solving. And he uses in that book the wonderful term indigenuity, using indigenous ingenuity for environmental problem solving. It's a, it's a wonderful and, and really landmark book. His visit today is sponsored by the ESF Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, whose mission is to create programs that draw on the wisdom of both indigenous knowledge and Western science on behalf of land and on behalf of culture. And, and Dan really exemplifies that mission. He's taken the lead in doing this integration of indigenous and Western sciences. He's a sought after speaker. A few of the things where you may have heard or seen his talks, many of which are widely available, is at the Rights of Mother Earth Symposium with Tom Goldtooth of the Indigenous Environmental Network. And Dan is also the driving force between the American Indian Alaska Native Climate Change Working Group, which we'll get to hear a little bit more about tomorrow and indeed, I think, this afternoon. And they're really building lots of partnerships around indigenous resilience and strategies for adapting to climate change. And known for his commitment to environmental defense, to cultural diversity, <laughs> Dr. Wildcat has been honored by the Kansas City organization The Future Is Now with its Heart Peace Award. And I've seen Dan in action for 20 years or more, and as I say, he's been an inspiration to me in, in, in my work and to countless students that I, that I talk with. So, um, chi miigwech for all of the work and for the leadership that you've, you've given us, Dan, and for being here to share your stories with us. A warm welcome for Dan Wildcat. Me, uh, I've got more wires on me than an FBI informant, I think, you know. Uh, I may have to go into the witness protection program after I'm done here. they got all kinds of wires on me. Um, so, Agi uh, Asawa, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, uh, Robin, and everyone here at uh, this distinguished institution for the invitation to be here. Um, Agelasan, Zoyaha, Yuchiha, Kadane, Adane. 
Good afternoon. I am Dan Wildcat, a Uchi member of the Muscogee Nation. And um, I think, you know, I guess even in our, our traditions, you know, there's always something about a name. And I was just thinking about that, having conversations today. And um, a lot of people will ask me, you know, about my name, you know. And I always think that's kind of real interesting because they say, well, what kind of name is Wildcat? And um, so just, just to disabuse you of the idea that we have no sense of humor, I was one time at a kind of a after Friday afternoon soiree and with a lot of very learned people and this woman came up and said, I'm fascinated by your last name. Tell me about your last name. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll make a joke. And so I said, well, you know, I said, that's an interesting story. It's a story many Americans have. You know, uh, when, you know, my ancestors immigrated to this land, we wanted to fit in so well that we changed our name. Uh, so, you know, my real name's Mac Wildcat. <laughs> but when we came over, we wanted to fit in, so we dropped the Mac off of there. <laughs> I'm glad you got the joke. She didn't. <laughs> And the next day I start getting these phone calls from people and I go, Dan, did you tell this person that you were Scottish? <laughs> and I was go, well, I was trying to, trying to tell a joke. Um, well, um, you're going to be saved of a, of a PowerPoint because I don't do PowerPoints unless absolutely forced to. I'm afraid you guys have all heard, I think, this probably. Uh, before it's it's uh, being said, I think commonly by people who do presentations and who don't do them, obviously. And that is, you know, uh, um, I think this was my my late mentor's kind of idea about PowerPoint. You know, Daniel, don't do a PowerPoint, darn it. The problem with PowerPoints is people who usually give them never have any power and they never make a point. <laughs> and so uh, you're just going to have to listen to some stories today, okay? some stories and and um, they're serious stories but they're stories that are, are filled with hope and um, so let's start with with the serious side of, of what we're looking at today and uh, at this point I don't think it it matters where you live on the planet uh, obviously we know our relatives in the circumpolar Arctic and in Alaska are seeing the most dramatic impacts of climate change. Every time I hear one of these sort of radio, TV, talk show kind of pontificators, you know, oh, climate change is a fraud, it's a scientific conspiracy, I think I'd like to get that person up on the Yukon River for about three weeks, you know, in January, or put them in Nome or Barrow. Uh, and, and climate change is not an abstraction if you're a uh, Yupik Eupik or Inuit or an Athabascan, you look out your window and you see it dramatically every day. And um, the news now is that all over the planet people are seeing it. It doesn't matter whether you live in the Midwest, doesn't matter if you live in the Southwest, doesn't matter if you're a Coast Salish person, doesn't matter if you're living up here, you know, in proximity to the lakes, or the Great Lakes, or New England, mid-Atlantic coast, extreme weather events. I've met a lot of climate deniers. I've met or never met a weather denier. And I think extreme weather events are beginning to shape up in a way that people, uh, even very conservative uh, Rush Limbaugh listening farmers in western Kansas are beginning to say, maybe we'd like to talk to you guys who've been talking about this a little bit now because they're facing, uh, they're going into a growing season now in Kansas after two feet of snow. We are still, we are still 13 inches down from our annual precipitation average. Almost half. And if we go through this summer with that kind of, of, of level of precipitation, farmers are going to be real hurting, and you're going to see it in your groceries you buy, too. We're already kind of seeing those little, those little bumps, you know. And uh, so I think, you know, as, as 
we look around us, even people uh, on the Jersey Shore, who those who have lived their whole life on the Jersey Shore, proud to be a part of that culture and that tradition. They're not New Yorkers per se. They live on the Jersey Shore. After Sandy, I think many of those people are interested in discussing what those who are looking at climate and the models that are being offered today are suggesting. Uh, some of you saw it. It was, it was a headline uh, two weeks ago, I think, and, and that is that the, uh, uh, the best and brightest of our climate modelers are saying, well, that storm wasn't a 100-year or a 500-year storm in our new kind of climatic systems that we're seeing, the changes in, um, you know, oceanic waters, water temperatures. Um, what we're going to see is that that may be a storm of that magnitude could happen every five to ten years. All of a sudden we've got people's attention because we're talking about money. They've got, we've got their attention. They want to they talk about money. And uh, because of the economic impact. And I think that um, in this kind of envir environment now, I think uh, that we're going to have a real opportunity to work in some really incredible activities. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to be humble in the things I'm going to say because I've got Oren Lyons here sitting in the front row, and, and Oren's been one of the, the leaders in doing the kind of things I'm, I'm advocating that we all get engaged in you know, for his whole life, even when he was doing his art in New York, um, New York City. I think the challenge is this, as difficult as you think the physical science of climate change is, I'm going to argue that's the easy part. The hard part we are going to have in addressing climate change adaptation, creating systems of community, urban, suburban even, resiliency, is that we are going to have to deal with the cultural and the social dimensions of climate change. We're going to have to talk to real people about it. Some people who are beginning, they're willing to acknowledge it, doesn't mean they respect it, doesn't mean they want to change the way they live yet, but the question is, do we have atmospheric scientists, oceanographers, foresters, ag people who can talk to a general audience, minus the scientific jargon, about climate change in a compelling way? And I will say, based on experience, I'm highly doubtful of that. They're good at giving scientific presentations. They're good at giving scientific, making scientific posters and doing PowerPoints. And no disrespect intended. I mean, that's the way this, these academies and these institutions work. I think the real challenge that we have is we are going to have to really work on communication in this intersection between the physical features of climate change, which I would say now, my, my basic argument I'm making to you, and, and, and you can challenge me on that when I'm done. I'm, I'm going to try to keep this formal talk rather short so we can have a discussion. Uh, I really want that. Uh, but my basic premise for this talk is, look, we're way past the time to argue about whether there is or isn't climate change. It's the, the evidence is insurmountable at this point. And increasing numbers of people are willing to listen. The question is, do we have competent people who can speak without people's eyes glazing over halfway through the talk, you know, about, oh my God, I don't know if I can get this, this chart you've got of the, the nitrogen, methane, you know, CO2 mixture of the atmosphere and how black carbon's factoring in there and all of this. And yeah, about halfway through that, my aunts and uncles are going to say, when does bingo start? <laughs> uh, that's not to say we don't value that, and that's not useful. The issue is this question of communication and accountability. 
And uh, I think we have a real opportunity now. And so, okay, maybe you'll even buy that point. Okay, I'm going to try to sell you on another point. The most eloquent, the most compelling spokespeople we have on climate in the world are First Nations people, indigenous peoples of the planet, and they are speaking from deep spatial experience. What do I mean from deep spatial experience? What is deep spatial experience? What I mean by that is indigenous peoples, their knowledge systems, their cultures, their language, their customs, their habits, their life ways were emergent, emerged out of this beautiful, complex, intergenerational, centuries-old relationship they had with the place they called home. There would be, it's almost inconceivable in indigenous patterns of thought and traditions to think that somehow we could treat culture as separate from nature. That may be the most damaging dichotomy we work with in the Western tradition, that there's culture and then there's nature. Well, look at where we're sitting now. It's easy to kind of think of culture as being autonomous from nature. Look at what we've created, this kind of space with the technology we have. When you live your whole lives moving in and out of spaces like this and then going to that next manufactured space in a box with four wheels, I'm, I'm not speaking here in any kind of, in any kind of uh, you know, romantic way. I'm just saying from uh, just a matter of experience, how would you expect people to have a deep experiential awareness of the land, of the plants, of the animals, of the wind. Nothing romantic about that. It's just that the way we live produces what I would argue is an insulated ignorance. We live such insulated lives, we have become ignorant about the natural processes we are a part of. The strength, I would argue, of indigenous ways of knowing is that we count as our co-collaborators, our partners in knowledge construction. And again, now this is going to sound maybe off-putting to some of you who have maybe more objectivist notions of knowledge or whatever, but I'm just going to put it out there. We take it very seriously that the way we learn how to be good human beings is looking at our other than human relatives who have something to teach us about who we are. That's tremendous. That is a, a, a very different way of looking at the world. Now, I'm going to quote Oren don't want to put him on the spot. He can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I've written this extensively. But he gave the most succinct statement of this I ever heard at the 25th anniversary of Earth Day. Remember when we were at the Ellipse across from the White House? 25th anniversary of Earth Day. We did a program there. Unfortunately, I think MTV ran something over on the mall, some concert to save Mother Earth. And, they forgot about the Indians over here in front of the White House. But we had two days of, of, of really song, storytelling. Grace was there. Grace Thorpe was there with us. Thomas Benyakua. Warren told a great story. You know, it was, you know, man versus nature or Mother Earth. Remember that story you told? You gave the story of this game we're trying to play. We keep thinking we're going to beat nature or Mother Earth. We're going to subdue her. We're going to control her. About halfway through the story, he said something I've used repeatedly, and I'll just ask you to think about that. So if you see people say, well, give me something practical to hang your notion of indigenuity on. I kind of like it, okay? Indigenous ingenuity. Let's exercise indigenuity. You want to try on a paradigm shift? 
That's, that's the most technical language I'll use, paradigm. Change in worldview, try this. Imagine how our conduct and our behavior would change if we walked outside these doors and we truly lived our lives as if these things we call resources were acknowledged as relatives. You don't manage your relatives. You don't exploit your relatives. Not in my family. You get put in your place all the time. If the only time you show up to see your aunt and uncles because you need, you know, a little more bread, you're going to find out real quick they're not ATM machines. And if that's the only time you come around, you're going to get in trouble. And yet when you think about it, the way we have treated this planet, have we not treated this planet as if it were an ATM machine and we're just taken out, taken out, where we're drawing? And when we look at what we put back in, it's not so good. I would argue that we should, that, that you know, moving from indigenous patterns of thought or moving from Western patterns of thought where we all think of nature as full of resources that we have to manage, that the indigenous perspective is in some ways really grandly liberating. It opens up all kinds of opportunities for research because guess what? Knowledge and solution building is no longer on your shoulders only. Well, that's a radical kind of thought, too. Think about this. I mean, so, so it's up for us to solve the problem. We've got to solve the problem. No, you can't solve the problem. You can't solve the problem. Now, you've contributed a lot to it, but the reason that you have contributed to it is because you live in a room full of mirrors, and all you do is look at ourselves, at humans, at our human creations. I would argue we begin to take seriously education systems, curriculum programs, professional school development, where we say, we're going to operate with a little different notion here and what being a good engineer, being a good doctor, being a good teacher, being a good biologist, being a good physicist means how are you engaged in relationship making with the rest of the living planet. And these relationships, we can learn something if we pay attention. But it's, it's, it's hard. I, I'm, I don't want to suggest to you this is easy. Uh, this, is, this is hard work. It's hard work because, again, uh, one more serious thing, and let's, let's shift it. You know, I, I promise there might be some hope here, and I don't think hope is some sort of empty, you know, dream or, or again, romantic notion. I think it's about action. I think it's about um, circumspection and an awareness of sort of the struggles we have in, in, in our lives. So here's the serious issue. So where's my phone that went off? You had to, did you have to wrap it up in something so it'd shut up? <laughs> now I'm going to ask you all and, and I am really challenging. I, I, want, I hope we'll have questions. I hope I say something provocative enough to get someone to question me afterwards. Because uh, when I speak, um, I've just very recently decided anymore, people say, well, what, where are you speaking from? What kind of authority are you speaking with? I don't have any authority. All I'm going to do is speak honestly. Because if I speak honestly, that invites you to correct me. I want, if I misspeak, please correct me. I'm speaking honestly, and I can be honestly wrong. It's happened before. <laughs> I've been honestly wrong. I'm just speaking honestly. So if you think I've misspoke, if I misunderstand something, please correct me. I want to be a better human being. So here's something that I've been, been wrestling with, and again, it, to me it's, it's a challenge. I was giving a presentation at a tribal college, I won't name which one, two years ago. And I gave one of my typical talks about the environment, about indigenous ways of knowing. I kept talking about the environment. And afterwards, the biology teacher came up and said to me, Dan, would you define environment for me? 
And I said, well, you know what I mean, the environment, all this around us. He says, I think you're missing something. He said, my students spend more time looking at this and using this than they do paying attention to just about anything else. What do we do when for a whole generation of young children, this becomes, for all practical purposes, their environment? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it means we've got to really think very seriously about the kind of optimism we have in the iPad, smartphone, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, Snapchat universe where people think, oh, we'll get a new app to solve that problem. I got students all the time that'll tell you, I don't need to memorize anything. Why do I need to memorize anything? I've got this. I'll look it up. What do you need to know? You want to know what the average rainfall in, in New Zealand was, you know, in 19, in the last decade? Here, I can get it for you. Give me 30 seconds. I don't need to know anything. I've got this. I think it's a major challenge. I think it's a major challenge we need to think about. And I think it's, Right now, it's not very popular, I think, to question this and the fact that in spite of the fact that people want to talk about how connected we are when we have this, this may be the greatest instrument of disconnection from lived experience that we're facing. I think it's real. It's very real. I'm not going to discount it. Now. Some of you are thinking, okay, we've heard this before too. What is this guy? Some kind of Kirkpatrick Sale Neo Luddite? All technology is bad? No, I'm not arguing that at all. I'm arguing again. I'll give you another example of indigenuity. We have an ancient formula for the value of technology. And if you've got a piece of paper, you can write it down. If not, some of you can memorize it or you can just put it in your smartphone. Okay, just put it just put it in your smartphone. I'm gonna turn mine off. I don't know who's trying to get me. Probably my my VPA who's saying, Where's the dean today? Uh, so I'm not anti technology. I think as we value technology, uh, that what we need is what mathematicians would call an operator. It's not exactly a function statement, but you would plug it into a functional statement okay, as a value that you'd use in that computation. So those of you who are looking at ecological uh, ecosystem services, think about this. I would argue that the most ancient formula among indigenous peoples, not all, I'm making generalizations, I'll own up to that right away. And we aren't perfect. I can give you examples of indigenous peoples who made mistakes with technology, and they're not here living the way, you know, those people aren't living the way they were 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 years ago. T, technology, is roughly equi equivalent to the numerator is the three C's. Community, communication, and culture. Now, you might say, well, that's redundant, because really culture and communication, and, you know, you don't separate. Well, again, it's, it's, it's iconic. Think of it as being useful in how we think about technology. The denominator is always place. Grasslands, a riparian wetland ecosystem, inner mountains, coastal, Northwest coastal lands, high deserts, forest. The value of technology should always give you a value when you put that numerator and denominator together, that function statement. It's going to always be plus one positive, and it has to be one where community 
culture and communication are enhanced. And I think we can make arguments, real arguments today, that a lot of the technologies that we employ today, some of them, and the way we employ them, maybe not the technology itself, but the way we employ them, because we don't have a good valuation for technology that includes community, that includes culture, that includes communication, has devastating consequences to places, to people, to their families, to their nations, and rather than enhancing communication, has impoverished it. Think about it. I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't use this, but the way we use this, we should be very circumspect about. And maybe if we had a different valuation system for technologies, we could use those technologies more wisely. Indigenuity. Let's move from systems where we think of the natural world as full of resources to one where we think of the world as full of relatives. Let's reevaluate technology so that we don't think of technology as strictly about human convenience and comfort and profit in an economic system of profit. But we think of it as profit relative to community. Community, by the way, no, community now, as I would construct it, remember what I said about indigenous knowledge systems, they are decidedly not anthropocentric. Now, I'm willing to discuss what this means with, with anyone who wants to, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. The people that I have listened to in my life who have shared very deep knowledges with me have been the embodiment of humility, have been the embodiment of honesty. And it's all right to say you don't know. But I think the challenge, the, the challenge that, we, that we really, you know, wrestle with and how are we going to wrap our mind around this is this fact that if we can start paying attention again to the natural world. And we don't have to, you don't have to, you know, uh, this is another thing, and, and again, this is, my, this is my take on it. People say, oh, well, you think we should all be able to go off and get close to nature and the forest and up in the mountains and go out in the desert. No, why don't you just step outside your front door and take a look around? Just start right there and see what you see, what you hear. You may be kind of be disconcerting. You may go, yeah, I really don't like this. <laughs> well, then do something about it. Um, again, I really, uh, I, 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 some people say, well, what do you call this? And well, yeah, I don't care what you call it. I, I've been calling it indigenous realism. I say, well, there's, there's an indigenous realism. Some people won't like it because the most real thing we will always begin with is spirit before we came into this world in this physical sense. We existed in a spirit world. I know that. Maybe you don't. That's, that's fine. That, that, I, I mean, because this wasn't knowledge acquired through experiment. It was knowledge acquired through experience. And I, I think Henrietta Mann, who uh, some of you know in this room, Dr. Henrietta Mann, she was a visiting faculty person at Haskell about, um, oh my goodness, it's been 15 years ago. And uh, my office was right next to where the classroom she's teaching, real thin walls, and I'd just sit there and listen to her lectures. And I remember one time she said, you know, she says, um, so I want to tell you, tell you young people something. I want you to think about this. She said, you know, she says, uh, uh, it seems like there are, if you go down to Borders or Barnes and Noble and you go to the bookshelves, you see all of these self-help books about religion and how to get in touch with your spirituality and all of this. And she said, 
She said, you know, these people are, they're all in search of their spirituality. And she says, you know, we don't have that problem. We accept that we are fundamentally spiritual beings. And she said, but we have a major problem. Our challenge is we struggle in our life to figure out how to be competent human beings. And that's really the struggle we're in right now. How can we mature to be competent human beings? What's the definition of immaturity? You're only thinking about yourself. You know? Um, I think humankind's been doing a lot of thinking about itself. I think we spend a lot of time looking in the mirror at ourselves. This is a very deep-seated institutional way worldview problem. And I'll give you an example because I, I, I don't know what... I've been thinking about this a lot because I've been really thinking about technology. And I, I, I thought, you know, I, I need, I've got this recollection. I need to pull this out and look at it. So if you look at the introduction of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, not the text itself, not chapter one, the introduction, it's only two pages long. And it's interesting because if you read that first paragraph, it starts like this. Nature, the art whereby God hath made and governs the world, that's kind of in paren, is by the art of man, as in many other things, also imitated. So that he may make an artificial animal. 